heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Caroline Hyde at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Ed, caution consumes investors as we eye a torrent of tech earnings this week. We discuss what to watch. But artificial intelligence momentum. We speak to the CEO of Runway on generative AI-powered video and we're joined by the executive leading Fidelity's charge into AI and machine learning. Meanwhile, legal headaches to blue check chaos. What on earth is going on at Twitter? The latest is all coming up, but first we dive into those public markets and that caution consumes the investor base and it means that we're lower on the Nasdaq 100 as we see and indeed the broader benchmark, the Nasdaq, off by eight tenths of a percent as we just wait and hope that maybe some of that fall that we're likely to see and the earnings coming from the big tech giants perhaps manages to not undergo some of those pulled back analyst estimates. We're also looking at what's happening in terms of the overall fundamentals of the macro economy. US yields actually down some four basis points. Some of that manufacturing data just showing that there is weakness in the overall US economy at the moment. We're also eyeing a debt ceiling that could be pulled forward in terms of our anxiety around that date. It's all down to some of those tax takings, not as high as we expected. Golden Dragon, though, I want to show that this isn't just nervousness in here in the US in terms of stock market. We're seeing China, the tech trade there, also going lower as we worry about some of the numbers from PD, the, from, from Pinduoduo and JD.com. Let's look across as to what's happening more broadly in terms of the world of crypto as well, Ed. I'm looking at, well, actually, after that heady highs that we'd seen in the 30,000, we seem to be trading off of that current level at the moment. We're at 27,000. So a horse, Caroline, to a more detailed Ed. Take it away. Yeah, in the first instance, just one name I'm watching, which is Tesla, now down 3% or so. Pretty big drag on both the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq 100. Boosting CapEx by a billion dollars, 7 billion at the low end of the range, 9 billion at the top end of the range for 2023. It's kind of this pledge that they continue to invest through downturns to maintain that growth momentum, even if that takes a hit to the bottom line, right? Margin and profit. Interesting because we actually opened a little bit higher earlier in Monday's session. We've certainly given way to that. It is a big week where earnings are in focus. You look at the sort of long list of mega cap names that are coming. We start with Microsoft, then Alphabet, the parent company of Google, Meta. And then we work through to May 4th in a couple of weeks' time or next week for Apple. Things are getting very serious because across the S&P 500 information technology subsector, we expect a pretty big drop when it comes to earnings, Carrie. Yeah, we're expecting the biggest drop in tech profits since 2009. Let's dig into the key companies you've got to keep an eye on, none other than Mark Mahaney. You know him, of course, Senior Managing Director of Internet Research over at Evercore ISI. And we wait with bated breath to the likes of Alphabet, some of the big heavyweights that really shine a light on how much companies are willing to spend on advertising and drive these sorts of companies forward, Mark. Uh, that's right, Caroline. So, yeah, we're going to get a lot of, I think there are three things we want to all try to, and all the noise we're going to get, the signal we're going to get this week, let's try to focus on three things. What are these companies telling us about the state of the economy? Is our advertising, retail trends, cloud enterprise spend trends, are they stabilizing, deteriorating, or improving from where we were in the December quarter? Our best guess is that trends are stabilizing to softening, not recovering yet. Mm -hmm. The second thing is cost. That's the new Sheriff in town, if you will, uh, all of these companies across tech uh, have uh, announced some sort of rifts, reduction in forces over the last three, six, nine months. I mean, it's a dramatic change in the mentality of Silicon Valley and of tech broadly. So is there more to come? And what does it actually mean in terms of the bottom line? How successfully these companies defending their free cash flow and earnings? And then the third thing is on the positive side is AI, generative AI. You already teased it out a little bit. Uh, and... Um, I imagine that every tech company is going to mention AI, and somebody should start a counter right now. How many times AI is mentioned yes. in the in the in the earnings uh, transcripts over the next uh, the course of the next couple of weeks? But it's going to be high, but for a reason too. We're at a bit of a tipping point because for a lot of reasons. Uh, but you know, um, ChatGPT really brought AI home to most people about what the power is of these uh, models, even though they've been deployed for a while. But the increase in compute capacity really allows kind of a step level increase in the application the deployments of AI. So talk about it. We want these companies to talk about how well positioned right. they are and what their deployment ideas are. 
It, Mark, let's go back to that sheriff in town being cost control. You know, probably the one point of commonality between those names is that they have done layoffs and other cost reduction action and how it shows up. I find Meta to be really interesting in that respect because the top line growth not, might not be there, but I think we're expecting a sequential improvement in margins, right, because of the actions that they've taken. I, I think that's right. I don't. I, I just think of these companies probably the one that's been most aggressive in taking out costs so far. Maybe surprisingly, it is Meta, uh, and I think these other companies. I think the market. I think investors want Google to do more with their cost structure. That's probably. And then I think market wants and investors want Amazon to do more too. I don't know about Microsoft. Um, uh, investors may be comfortable with where they are now, but yeah, I think at the whole. Investors kind of want a little bit more. Look, we 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 overbuilt, we overhired because we overextrapolated from COVID demand trends, but also because we're going into a softening demand environment. You know, households are going to have to tighten their belts, and so will companies. So I think there's going to be an expectation, or at least a hope. This question is whether it's going to be realized that we're going to hear more on the cost front from companies. I think we will from Meta. I'm not sure we will from Google, and I think we will from Amazon. But you know, it's hard to know. The three big beasts that you analyze, Mark. Amazon also will shine a light, as you said so rightly, on how willing companies are to invest in things like cloud at the moment, AWS, a big profit juggernaut for them, but also for Alphabet, who are hoping to break even in some way on that. What do you expect for how much companies are showing resilience in needing compute power right now? Well, I, we're decelerating. I, I think cloud uh, demand is, uh, is slowing down. Um, it, 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 it shot up during part of the COVID crisis. It's been a super hot, high priority level uh, area for enterprise spend for the better part of five, six, seven years. But it's slowed down and we're through. We're going through what's called an optimization cycle uh, where companies are going to, you know, when the renewals are coming up, they're demanding better, uh, bigger discounts or more capacity for the same price. That's clearly happening in the market. That means that these revenue growth rates that Microsoft is going to report with Azure and Google Cloud and AWS are going to report, they're all going to show a slowdown. And the question we have is just how low will it go? And I think we hope that the trough is kind of the June quarter. And we think with uh, Amazon, with AWS, you're going to have like a single digit percent growth in AWS revenue. I mean, that's kind of shocking. If you go back two years, nobody would have expected that to happen. But that's probably what's going to happen. And then the question is, how quickly does it base from there and start reaccelerating? We think it will base. We think it will reaccelerate. We just don't really know uh, just how quickly it will. Uh, so that, that's going to be an overhang on the stock. Mark, if we do get some upside surprise across this kind of pretty broad range of names, where do you think it will be? I think it's probably going to come on the margin side, Ed. I think it's probably going to come on the cost side because that's what these companies can control. You can't do much about demand trends in a softening macro environment. So I'd be really surprised if we had positive, you know, material upwards revisions on cloud enterprise spend or on retail spend or on advertising spend. I mean, I hope we get them, but you know, as a bull on these stocks, but I don't. I think that's highly, highly unlikely. And the, the what we should. Um, so I think there'll be positive news on the margins. We should all be just watching out for the chance that if we go into a hard landing in the second half of this year, I don't think that's modeled in. It may be priced in, but I don't think it's modeled into these companies. So that's what we're, you know, like I, I do worry, like fun uh, uh, valuation wise, I think there's upside to these stocks because they were so de-risked last year. But estimates wise, I think the first half of the year estimates are fine, a little bit of an upwards bias because of cost cutting. But I just worry about the demand trends. If we have a hard landing, estimates may need to come down in the back half of the year. So I, I don't know if that's more cautious than you wanted to hear, Ed, but that's kind of how we come out. And, and what's interesting about timing this year for this quarter, it used to be that Snap was the bellwether for where we would expect Alphabet yes. and Meta to go, but they're actually behind those two ones in terms of timing this year. Yeah, yeah you're right. Look, we showed the calendar earlier, Mark. It's just the, the cadence of the week gets bigger and bigger and bigger, but we don't have an early sense, apart from Tesla that's reported, on, on broadly where we sit in this market. You're right, uh, Caroline, and you're right. And, and it's odd the way you set it up, Caroline. You're, you're right that the market took Snap as a bellwether, but you know, come on, it's it's tiny compared to these other companies, and they haven't executed nearly as well. So they've really been a false uh 
false indicator most quarters, I would argue. So, frankly, I think it's better for the market that they report later because it's just noise that comes out of them. What you I, and I don't mean I don't mean that disrespectfully. I just think that they're less of a read through into the larger. Uh, and larger players. That's what I really meant to say in a respectful way. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, Google is going to give you a really good view on what's happening to overall uh, advertising trends. Google is uh, GDP advertising. So, uh, and I think they're going to talk about trends that are softening, not deteriorating dramatically, but are modestly deteriorating. And I think we should be prepared for that. I think it's yeah. going to be a, a real reasonable read through, certainly sizable. It's the single largest advertising data point you can get worldwide. Pay attention to Google. Mark Mahaney, well said. And pay attention to all of those AI headlines that come out of them as well. Evercore ISI, we thank you as always for joining us, Ed. Yeah, look, layoffs were a common theme of that conversation. Let's take a look at Disney, which began its second round of job cuts today, part of its broader push to eliminate about 7,000 jobs this year. The company says that by Thursday, around 4,000 jobs will have been cut. The cut stretched from Disney's headquarters in Burbank, California, to the ESPN Sports Network over in Connecticut. Now, coming up, Bitcoin hit new records after each of its previous halvings. Now, crypto analysts are projecting for a new high when the process takes place next year. We'll have more on how this will push the price of the digital token. Quick check of the shares of First Republic. Higher, 7% due out of earnings after the bell later today. A really keen eye on deposit flows still going, the health of that bank long term. Bringing the details, this is Bloomberg. So crypto taking a bit of a breather over the last few trading days, but analysts are actually saying Bitcoin in particular, its rebound, just the start of the rally that will take the coin past $50,000 next year, all because of what is a process known as halving. That's basically curbing the amount of tokens that miners receive as a reward for their work. Mike McClone, senior macro strategist from Bloomberg Intelligence, joins us now with more. And this so-called halving, we're anticipating what happens in about April of next year? Well, hi, Caroline. It, it makes me put on my trader's hat versus my investor's hat. The halving, I think, is a key part of Bitcoin's definable diminishing supply, which is unique to all commodities. Ethereum is kind of like that, just less, less, uh, more difficult to measure. But with increasing the demand and adoption, the price must go up over time. That it's a known known. The thing I'm worried about right. right now is this bigger unknown of the world tilting towards a recession, risk assets kind of tilting downward, and the Fed still tightening, and Bitcoin and the cryptos among the riskiest of assets. So I'm worried that we're more likely to have peaked around 30 and have some pressure for a while, particularly if we see more in the screen what we're seeing today with the stock market going lower and, and NASDAQ kind of trickling down below that 13,000 level. Mike, let's go back to basics a little bit. A halving or halvening, as it's otherwise known, reducing the amount of tokens that Bitcoin miners get as a reward for their work. What is the link between that activity and the anticipation of the price of Bitcoin going higher? What are the mechanics behind that? So right now, the most you can, you can, um, we can... Um, produce on a daily basis of Bitcoin mine is 900 coins a day. Before that was 1,800 before the last halving. So you get the next halving that's going to cut it back to 450 coins a day. It's by code and then four years from now it's going to do it again. That's just the beauty of the code. It has to go down the supply is declining. So right now the total supply is running around 2%. So right around the historical measure of gold. A year from now, it's going to drop below 1% because it's just definable diminishing. That's the beauty of it. And all those miners are fighting for more and more. But it's a unique thing about what Bitcoin does. No other commodity does that. You can say prices go up, supply comes on, particularly with gold. It does too. But most notably, learned that with crude oil last year. Right. But what's happening now is people are anticipating now it's going to just do what it did in the past. And I think the thing that's different this time, Ed, is Bitcoin was born out of the last great financial crisis, that recession. I think this one's going to define it, but it's going to be its first recession. And I think it's the first time we might see that the S&P 500 drop more than 20 percent into a recession, which should pull all risk assets lower. So I think I'll end with this. One thing you saw today was a little bit off topic, but similar is record shorts in 10-year, 30-year and bond futures might be indicative of gold continued outperforming, Bitcoin being pushed a little to the wayside.
All right, Mike McGlone, Bloomberg Intelligence, on a roll out of Miami. Thank you. Meanwhile, Caroline, don't know if you saw this one. Franklin Templeton says its money market fund used to record share ownership on a blockchain is seeing inflows specifically from crypto-related firms. The fund's total assets have increased to around $270 million. This is a, a, a fund that invests in U.S. government securities, does not hold crypto assets, but it's who's putting the money in. Yeah, because remember, a lot of, at the moment, these overall crypto investors or crypto-related companies they just lost a load of their financial infrastructure with some of the banks, right. Silvergate, we think, of course, Signature Bank coming out of the market. They want safer exactly. places to put their money. Of course, you kind of have to be banked to get into a money market fund, even if it's Franklin, Franklin Templeton. But I suppose it is no surprise that if you're going to look for a money market fund to gain you exposure, safe exposure overall, you're likely to go to one that's at least in some way in your line of sight and liking. And of course, the Franklin on-chain US government money funds, they're going to like that. There's sort of play there, isn't there? And at the moment, it's off-chain, yeah. but likely to be on-chain with that Benji coin. Uh, we saw the VCs do it, and now we're seeing the industry itself do it with their own money. Let's continue talking with the crypto market. Sunny Singh is here with more insight. He's the CEO of CS Labs 21 in stealth mode, but also, of course, a well-known person in this industry. Let's go straight, actually, to the halving or the halvening. Yep. What do you make of that? Yeah, it happens every four are years. A, are you a believer in the logic behind it? Yes, it, it makes sure like central governments can keep producing uh, new currency, which creates inflation. Bitcoin was created the other way to reduce the supply, which makes it more deflationary. So it's a great mechanism they built into the system, and it happens every four years. And it's scheduled to happen next April 27th, around roughly that date. And so right around a year from now. And you're going to start seeing a lot of media frenzy start happening six months to, you know, round that should start happening. And then you'll start seeing the price run up a little bit. Look, Sunny, to overall think about how much we've seen this torrid time within crypto, whether it's actually the likes of Bitcoin, ETH, sort of taking up a lot of the oxygen in the room when it comes to allocation at the moment, or at least where the rallies have been. Then there's also the question we were just talking about, the fact that a lot of crypto players find themselves without the banking infrastructure they were used to, the signatures, the silver bank, sil the overall silver gates as well. How difficult is it in the crypto space for you? It, it, it's very bad. So my company, we just raised a $4 million seed round. We did it in 45 days, which is great, from an all-star team of crypto investors as well as traditional investors. But the mood has definitely changed. The banking regulations have become increasingly hard. Getting banks is increasingly hard. Everything that could go wrong has gone wrong for the crypto industry. And yet the price of Bitcoin has rallied right. from 16000 to almost 30000 in the last six months, which is pretty remarkable. And I wouldn't be surprised if Bitcoin hits 40000 this year. Can, can I just jump in on that seed stage? Just broadly speaking, how difficult was that following the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. I don't know how, for how long you were negotiating the round, but you're basically taking a crypto proposition to investors who are a uh, bit more cautious than perhaps they previously were in that industry. Yes, it was much harder. And we wanted to get a mix of crypto investors as well as Silicon Valley investors. And the Silicon Valley investors might have loved the idea, but they're no longer doing crypto investing anymore. A lot of teams right. said they're now doing AI and pivoted. So it's much more difficult that way. And we were ready to wire our money the day before SVB had the issues, and we're going to SVB too. So we had to delay that three weeks too. So again, everything that could go wrong has gone wrong in the crypto space for the last year, I would say. And that's not even talking about some of the overall regulatory headwinds that still everyone is very worried about when it comes to how people are going to analyze, the SEC is going to look at some of these crypto assets. All these headlines, you see Gemini thinking of a non-US based derivative platform. We know that other key players are looking at licenses, crypto licenses in Bermuda. How tempting is it to take whatever you're building out of the United States? Yeah, and again, companies like Coinbase, Gemini, my previous company, BitPay, we try to play by the rules, work with the SEC. We all got New York Bit licenses. We're trying to do it the right way. But I think the SEC is now really getting a little harder to work with, and they keep changing their mind on things. And for companies like Coinbase or Gemini, it's trying to keep growing during crypto winter. It's hard for them to get full clarity on what to do. That's why they're looking offshore. And again, FTX, USA, FTX which went out of business, was created because a company called BitMEX ran into issues. And now with FTX gone, there's really a void in the international trading markets that's going to Binance instead. And companies like Gemini and Coinbase see a big opportunity if they can get, get this derivatives market and things like that that Binance has been focusing on. All right. Our thanks to Sunny Singh, CEO of CS Labs 21, which I hope to hear more about later in the summer. Now, coming up, more confusion surrounding Twitter's blue and gold check marks. Which celebrities are paying for the subscriptions and who's getting it for free next? This is Bloomberg. Thank you.
Twitter's legal battles over its mass layoffs last fall continue to grow, with two more former workers filing class action complaints and about 2,000 ex-employees pursuing claims in individual arbitration. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Sarah Fryer for more. 2,000 making claims is quite a big chunk of the workforce that was laid off. It, and it's all in individual arbitration, a mass arbitration, which um, often when companies put the arbitration clauses into contracts, they expect that uh, they'll be able to get things done quietly behind the scenes. In this case, I, I don't think that's going to work. I, I think it's going to become a very arduous and expensive process for Twitter. Meanwhile, there's been several people completely, well, many people completely baffled by what's happening at Twitter in general, particularly around who's got those blue check marks, who doesn't. It feels as though there's a lot of chaos there at the moment. I just want to listen in to what Ron Reynolds had to say last week about the service. Just take a listen, Sarah. I don't know. I mean, I see they, they all have sort of different um, footprints. I mean, Twitter is, has, is now and has always been a, a, a you know, piping hot dumpster fire of, of trash. And it, is a, it, is a, is, it can be a very difficult place, but it's also a place that there can also be incredible good. When you have words to say like that, are we unsurprised that with 21 million followers, his blue legacy check mark isn't being paid by Elon Musk? I think that we're actually seeing the check mark return to a lot of accounts in particular that have been critical of Musk. He's almost applying that brand to them as a punishment, which seems like <laughs> a strange, uh, a strange reward slash punish if you want people to buy a blue check using it against your enemies is is not the strategy i would pick but hey musk has he works in mysterious ways um i, I think we're also seeing the check reappear among the accounts of you know rather popular accounts with more than a million followers including some accounts of people who, who don't exist um, or who have since died uh, from before the checks were rolled out. So it, it is all getting a whole lot more confusing. And, and I think that um, it, it just means the Twitter blue experiment, um, nobody right. knows what it's for. Nobody knows. All right, Bloomberg, Sarah Fry, thank you. Cara, I would point out in Ryan Reynolds' case in particular, he is using Twitter Right. Think about the reaction video he shared yeah. filmed by Paul Rudd after his football team Wrexham got promoted. Millions of people saw that particular clip, several clips. What a story. They've got to make another documentary out of it, Ed. Yeah. And by the way, my mum was born in Wrexham, so I was oh. cheering from afar. Now, coming up, how generative AI can propel a new wave of storytelling. We'll discuss with Runway CEO Chris Valenzuela. That's all next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. Carrie, should we get a quick check on the markets yeah. and where we're trading in the technology sector? NASDAQ 100, softer by about seven tenths of a percent. Tesla, kind of a big drag on that index from a points perspective. Underperformance as well in the, in the chip space, semiconductors and the socks, off by nine tenths of a percent. Short end of the curve, though, it's interesting. You see the two year off by about three basis points, 4.14%. And as we said, we kind of cooled it on Bitcoin. $27,300 or so per token. There's a few specific movers that we're looking at in the markets as well when it comes to big tech names. Actually, tech names large and small, Mr. Director, if you change up the board. Tesla, as I said, to the downside, a pretty big drag. Microsoft also markedly lower, off by 2% ahead of earnings coming this week. Amazon also softer. C3 AI, an AI name that has been downgraded, not for any reasons to do with artificial intelligence, Caro, simply to do with macro and fundamentals. And you wonder now how much this market is getting a bit more realistic. Some of the momentum on the publicly mm. traded AI names, at least, kind of being taken out. Should we move on? Here's what some of our guests on the show have had to say about the rise of generative AI in that space, both from the sort of investing standpoint, but also let's have a little think about research too. Have a listen. 
Some of the best opportunities are, are sitting right in front of us. AI, I believe, will be the third largest compute revolution that we've seen in our generation. So we think the biggest opportunity and the safest place to deploy these type of technology is inside the enterprise itself. We'll see more of that AI to go into uh, traditional industries and helping them move faster and be more efficient. AI is global. It's not something local. It's not a fad. It's going to be here and it's, it is affecting all of us. This space is emerging so fast, frankly, it's very hard to track, even from an investor perspective. There's never like one very obvious, clear answer when you're getting into the weeds of how this technology can affect people. I'm a huge fan of making sure that uh, the government authorities work closely with the industry. Well, we've got yet more insight, this time from a heavily backed VC backed player in the space already making things, creating things in the real world. Chris Valenzuela is with us, CEO of the applied AI research company Runway. Basically, you're all about human creativity. You're about films. We've already seen what your own AI, generative AI, being used within everything, everywhere, all at once. How is it being used in a way that perhaps surprises you? Many ways. Uh, we started to see things that were just literally impossible to do before now being made possible with these technologies. I think we're still very early to understand the full creative potential of everything that will come. But yeah, you have folks like everything ever all at once using Runway to edit some scenes in there. You have musicians and artists taking like really the technology to the next level, which we think it's really the right thing to do, which is start experimenting and exploring more with, with these capacities. You have, of course, all of this excitement, euphoria. There's also a lot of nerves, particularly around people who worry that their own art, their own imaging is being used to train AIs on. How are you squaring that circle? Because it's a difficult one to navigate. Yeah, I know. And we've always thought about that um, in a very particular, interesting, dif different way. I come from an artistic background, and so I have deep empathy for those artists and those creatives who are asking themselves, what's going to happen next with this technology? I think a thing to remind ourselves is that we're still very early. And what we need to do is open the conversation to have more people come in and understand how you're going to start leveraging this technology in your art practice. Um, I think that for me is really, really important and um, something we practice in Runway kind of like from the very beginning. Chris, your Gen 2 system is, is still on a waitlist basis, right? <laughs> I know a lot of folks that I've spoken to out this way are keen to get access. But the reality is, you know, text to video, it, it generates about three seconds. And I wondered how much you're emphasizing the kind of early stage that this is in. Three seconds, not a lot of content to generate using the tool. I agree. Three seconds is not enough. Uh, we already have 15 second like long uh, support on Gen 2 and working towards including and adding more to that. I think the reason we released with three seconds is really to make sure that more people can get their hands on the research, on the product, on this new uh, way of creating content. And we already have thousands of people using it. And so the amount of feedback we've gotten to improve the quality of the model, the experience as well, I think text to video is one of many modes of using Gen 2, actually has eight different modes. Today we release uh, the mobile app uh, for the first time ever you can try Gen 1 actually on your iPhone. And so there's so many things yet to be explored and discovered here that for us really it's just making sure that we could put it in the hands of more creatives out there. I was listening to Noam Shazir, the CEO of Character AI, on the No Priors podcast the other day, and he faces a similar debate, right? How do you onboard users and grow the user base and then in the future monetize? And, and, uh, and I wonder how that equation looks for you as well, the focus on kind of making money or just growing the number of users and, and, and investing in the infrastructure needed to support it. I think it's, it's important that we remember that we're very early on the journey of both value capture and monetization industry-wide. And so making sure that you work with as many people and as many companies as you can will help you untap possible uh, value captures. I think overall what we're starting to see is just the initial stages of that. And for us, it's really making sure that we can keep building the research and the foundational effort to build better models and, and more safe models over time. Hey, Caro, I think back to when Sonia Huang of Sequoia was on the show, a venture capitalist explaining why she sees potential here. You know, think about one's ability to dream up anything and use the, the generative tool to just create your own video. That's where the VCs seem to be wanting to, to put their money. To augment humanity, not to cut yes. against it at the moment. But Chris, I turn to you and think about how enthusiastic certain VCs have been around you. I think a co to <laughs> Lux Capital, Felice, Felices. That you've got a lot of money coming your direction. Are you turning it away? Are you thinking about raising funds opportunistically? 
So we started Runway like four or five years ago. I've been working on journey models and creative tools for the last eight years or so. When we started, it was, it was hard. Journey BI wasn't really a thing, and mm. people told us we were crazy, like Journey BI was never going to be a thing. Really? Um, they did, as little as four years yeah, ago? Yeah, four years ago, people were like, Chris, this is, this is not a thing. Journey BI is not a market. <laughs> and so the one thing that I think has changed now is I don't have to convince more people that this is worth paying attention to. That's, that's for sure. Uh, but we're very fortunate to be able to work with investors that believed in that very early on, where perhaps there weren't as much proof points, uh, and it's a long-term bet. But I go back to what I mentioned before, it's still very early and a lot of what needs to be built around the industry at large is still yet to be built. Um, and so there's a lot of opportunities for more investors to invest in more kind of like- In you? Um, can't really speak about like fundraising, but uh, I think the industry at large will, will continue to grow very, very fast. All right, Chris Valenzuela, CEO of Runway. Good to see you, thank you for coming on the show. Keep us updated. Now, when this one physics teacher isn't in the middle of a physics lesson, He's in the middle of building one of the world's biggest free AI training data sets. Here's Bloomberg's Aggie Cantrell with more. At around this time, DALI 1 came out and I was instantly, wow, wow, this is so extremely powerful. Like now we can draw images from text and this will change everything. And I instantly understood that like, if this is like centralized to one, two or three companies, this will have really bad effects for society. We've talked for months about the benefits and pitfalls of artificial intelligence. But what we talked a lot less about is that these AI products are built on decades of data from across the internet. One data set, which has been used to train image generators, Stable Diffusion and Google's Imogen is called Lion 5B. Lion 5B was created by a team of hobbyists, including a high school student in London and a high school teacher in Hamburg. Lion is built on open source data. It scrapes public images from across the web and anyone can see what's in it. Stability AI, the company behind Stable Diffusion, is now seeking a $4 billion valuation, thanks in a large part to the free data from Lion. I think it's really important for this technology the models we train, the data sets we, we produce to stay openly accessible. But after discovering that their work was used to train stable diffusion, artists are now suing stability. Lion is cited in these suits, but not as a defendant. It's still an open question if these artists' work or any images that are publicly available online are fair game for these data sets. An answer may come soon with the European Union's AI Act a government's first ever serious effort to regulate artificial intelligence. If you want society to embrace technology and to trust technology, you need to have that social contract with society. The generative AI boom has also generated calls to ensure that companies disclose what images train their machines. Models like OpenAI's DALI 2 and ChatGPT, for example, have not really shared any details about their databases. While such regulation could be a win for artists and creators, advocates for open source datasets believe overregulation will only benefit big tech in the long run. If we try to slow things down and overregulate, there is a big danger that in the end, a few big corporate players can afford to fulfill all formal requirements. And in the end, this technology and all data that flows through it will be monopolized or at least highly centralized. And I see this as a real danger. As AI datasets and the rules around them are being developed in tandem, the question remains, how closely should we regulate what goes into them? That was the latest from Bloomberg's Aggie Council out of Germany. Now, the CEO of NBC Universal is leaving after admitting to an inappropriate relationship with an employee. In a statement after an investigation, Jeff Shell said he deeply regrets the incident. He served as CEO since January 2020 and worked at NBC Universal parent Comcast for almost two decades. A replacement has not yet been announced. Caroline. 
And just sticking with media, just check out the market capitalization hit to Fox today. $700 million has been lost as it's down 4%. Why? But it's parting ways with Tucker Carlson. Seems to be the real catalyst of the news. It's most popular primetime host. We know also the source of repeated controversy over his statements on everything from election fairness to LGBTQ rights. We currently see also plenty more news coming from the media world. We're going to dig into that in a little bit. But meanwhile, coming up, we're going to dig in more to artificial intelligence, of course, and its impact on wealth management. We're going to be joined by Sarah Hoffman, Vice President of AI and Machine Learning Research at Fidelity Investments. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Time now for the VC Roundup. Aerodyne Group, a Malaysian drone services company, has picked Citigroup for a funding round ahead of its planned IPO, according to sources. The startup seeking to raise up to $200 million and aims to make its first close in mid-year, ahead of an IPO in 2024 or 2025. And Schroders, a shareholder in the UK financial technology company Revolut, has cut the value of its stake by 46%. This is the second write-down to hit the company after the fintech firm's auditors raised questions on its 2021 revenue. Caroline. And we're going to stick a bit on the world of fintech, but we're going to focus in on the impact of artificial intelligence on it. Because we've talked about perhaps how AI is affecting yours and my life in general, generative AI, but what about wealth management in particular? We've got a bit of an optimist in the house, Sarah Hoffman, Vice President of AI and Machine Learning Research over at Fidelity Investments. And really what takes us about some of your thoughts in AI and wealth management, Sarah, is the way in which you think ChatGPT or those sorts of large language models could assist with upgrading our approach to financial literacy. How do you see that happening? Yeah, so um, obviously the financial world has become so complicated. Mm. I would really want more people to be able to access and understand um, finances. And one thing that I could see happening with generative AI, I mean, we've been talking about personalization for so long, but this technology really takes personalization to the next level when it comes to any type of education, but specifically um, financial literacy, which is so complicated. You can ask this technology, you know, explain this to me as though I'm a fourth grader. Or if you're somebody who's very into sports, you could say, explain this to me with a sports metaphor. We can all really learn in our own way now, which is super powerful. Yeah, I've already been doing it to explain it to my five-year-old. I'm interested, though, Sarah, as to how much information you talk about personalization. How much are people willing to share their own financial information and asking for examples and advice, shall we say it, via ChatGPT. How right is that to do at the moment as well? Right now, I would not recommend using it for advice, but I do believe this could be great before you meet with a financial representative. So if um, a customer could really learn on their own before that meeting, and even the financial representative could use these tools before the meeting, I think we can have a much better, more informed discussion with better questions where um, even though I think the human is still essential, everybody's gaining and coming in a, a, in a better place. Sarah, I'm, I'm interested in you and, and what you're up to at Fidelity. Give me a typical day in the life of Sarah Hoffman working in the field of machine learning and AI, but at Fidelity. I focus specifically on what's coming with technology over the next five years. Um, Fidelity is a company that really wants to make sure we are ready for what's coming across our business units. And so at Fidelity, we focus specifically on building the next generation digital platform while also focusing on the human element of the industry, which we believe is very important. And so my role specifically is really making sure we are aware of the trends that are coming. Would you say that you work closely more internally with your technology teams or how close are you also working with the investment teams to basically say, look, this is a tool that we could use and here's how we might potentially use it. Yeah, so I um, write research papers and give um, presentations and talks and have dialogue across the company, across roles and for um, you know, both of these types of roles. And how much are you using everybody. ChatGPT to help write those research papers now, Sarah? 
I've tried. Um, I would right now. Um, one of the um, main issues with tools like ChatGPT is that they really don't have current information, so mm. you can't really rely on it for if you're looking for trends or anything um, that's and it doesn't understand or know about what's happening right now. But it's still useful for if you're trying to figure out a nice structure or even brainstorming, you know, how, right, how can generative AI be useful in wealth management? Um, it's a useful brainstorming tool, yeah. um, but because it doesn't know today, I wouldn't recommend it to, to trust it blindly. One nice thing I would add about using it for brainstorming is that today it could produce things that you cannot trust. And when it comes to brainstorming and trying to find a novel insight, it doesn't actually matter if you can't verify the results as long as it helps you think more creatively and think differently. So to me, brainstorming is actually a perfect use case for these tools. Sarah, it was interesting. We just had Chris Valenzuela on, who's the CEO of Runway, thinking about generative AI in the world of creation and particularly in images. But he said when four or five years ago, he was speaking to VCs and they were like, generative AI is not a thing. It's not going to be a thing. Did you, as someone who has to look at what's the trend in four or five years, see this coming? So I saw this coming, I would say me personally, with GPT-3, the previous version of ChatGPT, which was released in 2020. Um, it was so much better than, and it, you know, generative AI existed before, but this was so much better than anything we had seen before that, um, you know, that I and many others were, you know, looking at, you know, how can, what can, what does this mean? Mm -hmm. Basically, the conversations that started in November with everybody else yeah. really started back in 2020, 2021 with GPT-3 for those of us in the AI world. Sarah Hoffman, we thank you for all your advice and, and perspective there. Vice President of AI and Machine Learning Research over at Fidelity Investments. Meanwhile, coming up. Wow, big day for media shakeups. Fox News, CNN parting ways with primetime hosts. How does it impact the value of the companies? That's next. This is Bloomberg. There is quite the whirlwind of media departures today. From Tucker Carlson departing Fox News immediately, sending Fox shares plunging, as we've already seen in the show, down $600 million in terms of market cap. We've also seen CNN star anchor Don Lemon leaving after being under intense scrutiny following remarks all the way back in February about women and ageing. Let's break all of this down with Bloomberg's Felix Gillette. Extraordinary. Let's start with Tucker oh. Carlson. Mm -hmm. How much is this linked to settlements with voting systems and the like? I think it's uh, definitely fallout from the Dominion settlement. Uh, Rupert Murdoch in the past has shown that during times of controversy, he's totally willing to get rid of talent. Um, and if you think back to the phone hacking scandal, closing news of the world, getting rid of writers, reporters, left and right, right. I think uh, you know, Murdoch has always felt confident that he can replace the talent, even if it's someone like Tucker Carlson, who's currently the top rated primetime host for Fox News. You think back of when Fox News got rid of Glenn Beck, Greta Van Susteren, Megyn Kelly. There are always this question, oh, how are they going to recover? And yet, whoever they plug into those time slots always seem to do quite well. Felix, our colleagues at Bloomberg Intelligence have a react out. They're pointing out Fox News $2.2 billion of EBITDA or 70% of profits. You can see why there's that market reaction. CNN, Don Lemon, what do we know? Don Lemon has been, you know, going from one controversy to the next for the last couple months. They brought him back after he made these comments about Nikki Haley that upset people. Um, you know, the problem with Don Lemon is not only is he generating negative headlines for CNN, but also the ratings have been lousy. So combine those two things. Chris Licht, who's overseeing CNN now for Warner Brothers Discovery, has been under a lot of pressure. Uh, you know, ratings have been way down ever since... Uh, Donald Trump left office for CNN, and so the fact that they would make this switch, it almost seems surprising to me that they haven't done this previously. Felix Gillette with the inside track on what is a whirlwind of headlines. We'll let him get back to his analysis, his reporting. We thank you so much. Meanwhile, 
Oh, well, quite an extraordinary start to a Monday. And Ed, I thank yes. you for rolling with my rather hoarse voice. I wasn't out partying, I'm afraid to say. But uh, we, that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Tune in tomorrow for our Gear Up, the coverage, your coverage of RSA Cyber Security Conference over in San Francisco. We've got the AT&T COO, among many more. Yeah, look, huge weeks of earnings, just mega cap names coming left, right and centre. If you want to recap, don't forget, we have the podcast on Bloomberg or other platforms where you get your podcast so much to think on. This is Bloomberg.